So by now, 276, you have longed for the ability to use repetition. So that's what chapter five is all about, repetition. And before we get into the story set up for this, you will notice um, that we are looking at 5.6, the for loop. And I know that numerically, you know that 5.6 does not in fact follow immediately after 5.1. We're gonna take these out of order. Um, and that's because I can. Um, and it's also because um, what we'll do is we'll move from what is most probable to what is least probable that you are going to want to use as a developer. The for loop, and you can see right here, this is on page 251, you can see it says, the for loop is ideal for when you are performing a known number of iterations. And I just want to go through what everything here means and why we're starting with the for loop. An iteration is how many times a loop is going to execute. And we may as well start by defining what a loop is. A loop is a way for our program to you know, perform a task a number of times. Now, that idea of a number of times is the iteration. Each time the loop goes through and performs a task, it is known as an iteration, a plus plus, if you will, to connect that to our 5.1 with the increment and decrement operators. So the you know the reason we want the loop is because we know as developers you've probably already felt it as a developer you know that you don't want to repeat code again and again and again and again because that gets to be really messy it gets to be just not even logically difficult to follow but just visually difficult to follow if you think about and yes that previous assignment we're about to reference was a wee bit of a trap. Um, the 4.1 challenge problem where you were doing your uh, user authentication sign on and display when you are uh, tasked with given or giving rather the user three attempts to log in one, two, three, you know that the logic there is going to be essentially the same get username, get password, check username, check password, continue. And you had to rewrite those somewhat laboriously three times. Now, I know that you could have just copied and pasted the if and the else statement from your first um, set of nested if else's and copied that again into your third attempt. Uh, and you would have been just fine. And I know that's a little bit unfair because I've seen it before and you guys have only seen it there for the first time. But the the idea there is to leave you wanting a little bit more and that more is a loop so where you can perform the same actions with the same steps until a desired result is um is encountered and we are going to see that here in the chapter the reason we start here with the for loop is because a for loop is done on a known number of iterations for the most part so what that means is that you as the developer know or set up the logic so that an interaction is performed exactly a number of times so if you think about a a clock for example, a clock is a really good instance of a loop, right? So you start at the top at 12 and you work your way around from 11 to 12 again. And then what happens? Essentially, the same thing is performed again and again and again, right? So for every 12 hours, the, uh, the, the hands on the clock reach 12 and then continue. So that is what is known as an infinite loop, a loop that never stops. When the batteries run out, that's when the logic stops. But when you put batteries back in and set the time, it just continues to go until the battery dies again. But we know um, as people who have seen clocks before, we know the basic setup for a clock. We know that a clock 
has 12 hours on it. We know that each um, hour in our clock has 60 minutes. So those are known iterations. So that's something that's generally pretty easy for the user to um, to actually write out in code. And it's pretty easy for the uh, developer to, um, to test because if we know the known number of iterations and we know what the logic, the actual algorithm is inside of that for loop, we should be able to look at our outcome and confirm, yes, the logic is good. It's doing what we expect it to do. So that's what the for loop gives us. So let's look at some of the pieces of the for loop here really quickly. And again, this is on page 251. Um, and you can see it's our first table here um, on the left hand side. Uh, a for loop, so F-O-R in all lowercase is our keyword for that. And then it's followed immediately by a set of parentheses. The things that go inside of the parentheses are the things we are going to use to manage our loop. So that's why I start here with the for loop. Everything is managed right there in the first line of the for loop. And it's, it's, it's easier, I think, to get traction doing that. So inside of our for loop, we have our first statement, and that's what's known as initialization. That's where we set up a counter that we are going to use to iterate through our loops. And remember that iterate just means to progress through it until we're done. So after the semicolon inside of our for loop at the initialization step, uh, we have what is known as the test. So we need to give a loop something to test against so that it's true or false, so that we know, or logically C++ knows, when to exit from that loop. And then finally, we have the update statement. We need a way to move that test expression forward until we don't have to move any further. So the update is our iteration plus plus, which gets us ever closer to whatever the, 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 the test expression is so that we can get out of our for loop. So let me show you what it looks like and we'll see examples in the code samples and I'm, I'm happy to have you, you know, go over to look at the code sample right away for the for loop so that you can see this in action after we talk about the initialization, the test and the update. So here, this is figure 5-6. It's on page 252 um, in your book. And you'll see, again, we start out with our keyword, for. And then we have, inside of our parentheses, count equals zero. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, usually, um, you would declare a an integer for your counter right here inside of your your for loop. So you would say int count equals zero because what you're doing there is you're telling C++, I declare that there shall be an integer, it shall be called count and its value is zero. Because then what happens is we have this brand new variable that we can use just here inside of our for loop. And as soon as we leave the for loop, that's forgotten about. We can forget about count ever existing. It doesn't have to be something that we reuse from some other point in our code. It's neat and it's tidy and there you go. One quick note here, and I've mentioned this before, you'll notice that our counter starts at zero. So remember that in the computer science fields here in programming and elsewhere, counters start at zero. Zero is our first positive integer because it is not negative. So zero is where we start our counters. There's a whole long like historical reason for this. We don't want to throw away our zeroth item because that's where things start. It represents a valid storage location. Now storage is cheap, processing is cheap, and we kind of think, well, why? We can throw away one storage location, but 
historically that has not always been true so we always start our counters at zero and that's what we get with you'll remember from chapters one and two we had the idea of n minus one the number that's n of loops we want we subtract one from to account from starting at zero as opposed to starting at one you will get used to this and you should get used to this because that is you know, a core switch that you have to make um, here as part of algorithmic thinking for program design thinking because developers start at zero. So that is the first step, our initialization expression. What we're doing is we are initializing. We are creating a condition that our for loop will live with. So after the semicolon there, we have our evaluation expression. Count is less than five. So this loop is going to iterate five times. Now, I know that you're looking at that. And you're saying less than five, Eric. That's less than five. You're right. It would be if we didn't start at zero. So just to, to do it laboriously one time, start with me here. Zero, one, two, three, four. Wait a second. Zero, one, two, three, four. Wait a second. Zero, one, two, three, four. So you're telling me that the total number we can count to here is four, but it's really one, two, three, four, five iterations through. Yes, that's our n minus one. The off by one is something that developers have to get used to. So because we start our counts at zero, inside of our test expression, expect number minus one because that helps you account for that shift from zero. Then finally, after another semicolon, we have count plus plus. This increments our counter. So let's walk through it again. Our first counter starts at zero. That's our first iteration. And that's the first loop through our for loop. We increment that so that the second loop around, we have one and we go through our expression. We increment that. Our third loop through, we have two. We go through that expression. We increment our counter. We have three. Three, we go through our expression. We increment our counter. We go to four. Four, we execute our algorithm. We increment our counter, and we come back to test our expression. Is five, that would be the counter is set at now. Five is not, in fact, less than five. Five is less than or equal to five. So when that test expression evaluates as false, the for loop is exited from and whatever the next line that follows either. Now, the following is true. You can see it right here on 252, uh, it is the, um, the same way that our selection statements, the next line after an if is associated to that if. It is true here that the next line after a for loop is associated with the for. It is also true that you should not rely on that. You should get in the habit here of after your for loop, including a statement block. So an opening and a closing curly brace. When you do that, we can put more than one statement or more than one line of code rather into that statement block. And that's infinitely more useful to you as opposed to saving two lines of essentially empty code. So is it true that the line that follows a for statement belongs to the for? Yes. Is it also true that you should absolutely not do that? Uh, that you should get in the get in the habit rather of adding a statement block after your looping mechanisms? Yes, absolutely so. So after that statement is evaluated as false, uh, 
whatever the next line of code after your statement block is, that's where the flow of control will return to, and that's where the next line of code will be executed. So we have a little wrinkle here in the top to bottom, left to right in that order exclusively, is top to bottom, left to right, until we hit a loop. Then we enter into our loop, go top to bottom, left to right exclusively until we're done. And then C++ will return us to the next line of code in normal flow that follows our for statement. So I know, I know, I know that number one, that video, this video, this one right here has been very, very long. And I do apologize. Uh, and I know, I know, I know that this is unsatisfactory because you've just had to listen to me verbalize our way through two lines of code for 20 minutes and that kind of stinks. Yes, please though, go over to the code samples, look at the code sample for the for loop and we'll take, you know, express measures to go through bit by bit to look at our initialization part, uh, part of that statement, to look at the test expression, to look at the update expression and get everything right for our first most developer-friendly version of a loop, which is the for statement.